Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this video is intended for my AP Biology students, and we are just starting in on Unit 6. So let me make myself a little bit smaller. So Unit 6 is all about gene expression and regulation. I just want to point out a resource for you if you are new to my videos. Um, so I have created these unit – well, the – College Board has made these unit guides. I have just annotated them. And if you would want to have access to all of my unit guides for the entire year, you can go to my Google site. You can either search me or go with this bit.ly right here, bit.ly forward slash Sloan bio. And you will be going to then my website and then you just want to select AP Biology and then you will find all of these unit guides here. So let's get, if you look at the unit six, so it tells you exactly the topics and then the expectations that you need to know for unit six as you scroll down here. And then I just want to remind you here at the bottom, and these will be updated with this year's videos as I make them right now. These are two older presentations from last year. But what might be especially helpful for you is over here on the column on the right is the additional materials. I have links to the Khan Academy reviews, um, my seventh period reviews, um, Bozeman videos, prezzies and quizzes that could be helpful for you as you're trying to learn this material. All right, so I'm going to go ahead here. I pop back here and I'm going to go and present. Okay, so here in unit six, um, if you look underneath the titles, gene expression and regulation, but it's 6.1 through 6.8 that you need to know. So DNA um, structure, replication of DNA, transcription and RNA processing, translation is how you're translating that message into proteins. Then how is uh, transcription regulated? How is the entire gene regulated? Um, we'll look at gene expression and uh, cell specialization, mutations, which you may have already touched on a little bit in your last unit when you learned about inheritance and biotechnology. So as far as this unit goes, um, we will, there we go, um, when I, okay, I'll try to move myself over here, on gene, exp gene expression and regulation, here you can see the topics one more time. As far as this chapter goes that I'm going to introduce with the first video today, it's going to go through 6.1 through 6.4. I'm going to break this into two videos. And at the end of the second video, I'm going to bring in a little bit more about mutations. So we will focus on 6.1 and 6.2 in this video, but the chapter will cover a bit more. So we want to remind ourselves about the chromosomes and in eukaryotic cell, those would be linear chromosomes like in this picture and inside of the nucleus. And those chromosomes on them, there are genes and those genes code for proteins. So we have this code book and the way you get the way that code book speaks, it speaks through its proteins primarily. So the question historically, if you're looking at your notes, by the way, my notes are in the, a link to my notes are in the descriptor of the video down below, as well as a link to this presentation is included in those notes. So trying to understand what DNA, that that was our code book, that was a pretty big deal. Because I want you to think about DNA, remember has four nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And Whereas when you look at our amino acids, we have 20 different amino acids. So if you think of these as words, right, or letters even, what would you be able to do more with when you had a variety of four or you have a variety of 20? So it wasn't always known that DNA was our actual code book. There could be an argument put forth that proteins were our code book. So there is a series of experiments, classic experiments that you want to be familiar with to help us understand that. So the first thing they needed to know or that they that they knew, whatever the code was, it had to be able to store information. It had to be stable so it could be replicated, right? And it had to mutate because it had to provide variety. So the experiments start with, and if you go on your notes, this is underneath transformation of bacteria under 12.1. Scientists trying to discover what our genetic material was composed of knew that it had to A, store information, 
B, stable, so it could be replicated accurately, and C, able to undergo mutations. Okay, so now we're caught up on our notes. So classic experiment number one is Griffith. So in Griffith's um, experiment, what he did is he had strain S of a bacterium, and if he injected strain S into the mice, they clearly died. But if he took strain R and injected it into the, back, the mice, um, then they lived. So the lethal strain is strain S, and notice it's got a capsule around it, okay, but strain R does not. And so then what they did in the next part is they heat killed the lethal one, remember with the capsule around it, the S strain, they heat killed it, and then they injected it into the mouse and the mouse lived. Then one more step, mix some heat killed, now it's, you know, it's no longer lethal because it's been killed with heat, but mix it with some live R and inject that into the mice and the mice died. So they were able to then pull from the dead mouse um, some, isn't that a band? They were able to pull some live S strain out of it. So ha what happened? Clearly this live R strain must have gotten something from the S, but what did it get? So let's write down what we know so far. Classic experiment number one, Griffith's transformation experiment while trying to find a vaccine against strep. In the 1920s, the bacteria strain S is virulent and it has that mucus capsule around it. It's the blue colored one. Strain R is not virulent, no capsule. The subject, they worked on mice. The experiments, they inject the heat killed S and the mice would live. When they had heat killed S, the mice would live. Inject with heat killed S and live R and the mice died. So the conclusion was that some substance necessary for the synthesis of the capsule and therefore the virulence must pass from the dead S strain to the living R strain to change it, to change it. So then a follow-up to that experiment was done by Avery McLeod and McCarty, three scientists, which I think sounds like a law firm. And what they noticed is if they degraded the proteins and RNA, if they put an enzyme in that degraded proteins and RNA, and this is outside of the mouse body, um, that transformation still occurred. It would still gain um, its ability to be lethal. But if they used enzymes that degraded the DNA, then no transformation took place. So that is then saying whatever is transforming, it must be the DNA. And also the molecular weight of the transforming substance was enough that you could have variability. Because remember what we said before, DNA only has four bases. So you must have a whole bunch of it if you're gonna get the variety that you need to control and make these proteins. So on the follow-up to the classic experiment, Avery McLeod and McCarty used enzymes to degrade both proteins and DNA, and only those degrading DNA prevented transformation, prevented transformation. Okay, and yet we have another experiment. Now, that this experiment, the original mouse experiment was in the 20s, 1920s. The um, Avery McLeod and McCarty, this one right here was in the 40s. And so now we're gonna go to the 1950s. Mrs. Sloan was not born yet. All right, so um, I will go to the 50s, but today, when we talk about transformation, we can transform living organisms. And if we're back on campus, we will do exactly this. We will form recombinant plasmids and transform E. coli to express eukaryotic traits. But um, in, back in the 1950s, we have another experiment, two other experiments, Her Hershey and Chase. And Chase uh, was Martha Chase. And they worked with bacteriophages. Now you're seeing an image, a diagram here, um, and um, on the left, and then here's some images of a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage or bacteriophage is a virus that just infects bacteria. Now you need to know in the 1950s, they didn't have this image. The only thing they knew about a virus is that it, it had, in this case, two things. It had protein and it had DNA. Now here you can see the arrangement of that. The protein is a protein capsid and the DNA is within that capsid, but they didn't know that. But they knew that viruses could overtake cells machinery and get that cell to produce more viruses. So what was the transforming substance when they went in and, and took over that bacteria? So really elegant little experiment. What they did is they grew the viruses up where they could label the protein part and they could label the DNA part. 
So they used S35 um, uh, to a sulfur. Sulfur, um, if you remember, cysteine is one of your 20 amino acids and it contains sulfur. And so they labeled all the protein with the S35. And then remember your DNA, base, sugar, phosphate. So they labeled all the phosphate molecules with radioactive P32. So Though they couldn't see what a virus looked like, they knew it was shooting something into the bacterium. So was it shooting in radioactive sulfur or was it shooting in radioactive phosphorus? That, that would be how they could tell. So on, um, let me see. Yeah, we'll leave that. We'll keep going here. I'll catch up on your notes in just a second. So look what they used. Um, they allowed labeled when the viruses were labeled, um, the DNA with the P32, they gave it enough time for the viruses. They added the viruses to the bacteria, gave enough time for them to infect. And then they wanted to separate the viruses from the bacteria because they knew the virus did not move in, but it just shot something into the bacterium. So this high tech gadget they used, a blender and spun it really fast, and then the viruses broke off from the bacteria. So now they're two different entities. So then what they used is a centrifuge, which spins really fast, and the more dense, the heavier um, molecules, particles, cells are gonna go to the bottom, and that would be the bacteria, and the viruses would be on top. And when they analyzed it, down at the bottom in the sediment where the bacteria was, um, was, and I need to get myself a pointer, down here in the bottom where the sediment was, that's where they found the radioactive um, phosphorus. So they knew that the phosphorus originated in the virus, right? Because they labeled that virus with it, grew that virus up with that radioactive phosphorus, and now it's down here in the bacteria. And what was the phosphorus tracking? It was tracking the DNA. So the conclusion, the, the virus gave the radioactive phosphorus to the bacteria, which is what infects them and changes them. But just to be sure, let's do another experiment. But this time, let's label this, you know, we use virus that is labeled with the radioactive sulfur, S35, same deal. Give it time to infect, um, separate the virus and the bacterium using a blender, centrifuge, down in the sediment, there was no uh, radioactive sulfur because the sulfur was a component, a structural component of the virus and it remained with the virus. So that was not what the virus was sending in. Okay, so the, if you look down at the bottom here, it says the protein in the virus is not passed to the bacteria, it remains a part of the virus. So proteins are not transforming factors. So that helps solve that argument. So on your notes for classic experiment number two, Hershey and Martha Chase, um, in little letter A where it says worked with the bacteriophage, a virus with a nucleic acid corn protein coat, the phage would inject its blueprint into the cell to make more phages. And then the rest of that is already included in your notes. All right, good job. So now let's keep going. And um, let's look at another experimenter um, who helped us with our understanding of DNA. He lived from 1905 to 2002, and he analyzed one of the components of DNA, which are the four nitrogenous bases. And I just wanted to put this picture in here because they always show these scientists when they're old and getting prizes. And I just wanted you to see he was a young man um, as well. So this is what we know today. We know that DNA is made out of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And we know that adenine and guanine have double rings and they are referred to as purines. And we know that thymine and cytosines have a single ring and they are referred to as primidines. And in our base pairing, we know now that A binds with T and G binds with a C, a purine with a primidine. But that was not always understood and Chargaff is the one to, that helped us to understand that. So on Chargaff in the 1940s, um, so this is around the time of Avery McLeod and McCarty. He analyzed the DNA base content, but didn't know its connection to the structure. And I gave you B and I gave you C already in the notes. Um, so when we look at DNA, do you remember when I talked to you about before, when we looked at Avery McLeod and McCarty, that you needed to have enough of that DNA that you could get variety, right? So when we look at the human chromosome, base pairings, there are 140 million base pairs. And since there are four bases, when you want to talk about sure volume, then you take four, raise it to 140 million. That's how many base pairs we have. That gives us enough to have a lot of variety, even though we only have those four letters. So you have that in your notes. So we can add to one C, 
um, that this can provide enough variability. This can provide enough variability. So let's look at what Chargaff's rules were. Number one that he came up with is the composition of DNA does vary between species. So whatever, however many adenines we have as humans is not gonna be the same as a fungus or a fruit fly. However, within a species, however many adenines you have, you had the same percentage of thymines and same goes for guanine and cytosines. He did not know what that meant, but Watson and Crick could use that information. So if you look here at Homo sapiens, we have approximately about 31% adenines and we have about 31% thymines. Now we know those are paired together and you can see the guanines and cytosines are about the same. But notice it varies between each species. So Chargaff rules, the amount of A, T, G, and C varies between species, varies between species. However, in each species, the percentage of A is going to equal the percentage of T, you want to put that in your notes, and the percentage of G is going to equal the percentage of C. So if you looked at this at a, at a, as a bar graph, you can see this for our human DNA composition. So riddle me this, if I told you that 20% of the bases in DNA in a DNA sample were adenine, could you tell me the percentage of the rest of the bases? So you could pause me for a second and work it out. Okay, I'm sure I'm asking my students this in an ed puzzle. So yes, you could, because you know, you know that I can never move my face here. You know that if 20% are adenine, then since it's paired together, 20% must be thymine. You add those two together, that's a total of 40% of your DNA. What's left? 60%. So that remaining 60% needs to be split between guanine and cytosine. So I would not be surprised if you got a question like that, where they give you a percentage of one and then ask you a percentage of another base. All right. So, and yet here is another experiment. So Watson and Crick, Okay, so they had Chargaff, that A's and T's and G's and C's, right? They also knew the basic composition um, of DNA. They could do that. And they knew about bond angles, right? When you look at the angles of the bonds between carbons and other carbons and hydrogens, etc. Okay, but here was a really key piece of information. And Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, what they were doing is they were taking crystallized DNA and X-raying it and then looking at the patterns that it made. Just like if you had a broken bone, right? You're x-raying and it would put a pattern and you could tell if there was a break in your bone. So this picture right here is what they got. And from this picture, now mind you, they were doing a lot of these. So let me try to help you understand this picture. They could, they could tell that this was a double helix and it was of constant diameter and that there was repeating portions. Now, the way I help my students see this is imagine that you are at the top of a staircase and it was a spiral staircase and you were looking down that spiral staircase, right? Imagine these as your nitrogen, you know, like you're looking down the stairway as it spirals down and that's what you're looking at right here. So they could tell that it was repeating units of constant diameter, right? And that it was a double helix. So this was very helpful for Watson and Crick. So on your notes, Rosalind Franklin, 1950s, produced X-ray diffraction photographs, X-ray diffraction photographs, and showed that DNA is a helix of constant diameter and has repeating portions, and has repeating portions. So let's see uh, what Watson and Crick did. And here are some pictures of them as young men and older. And so they took that information, and that's why you can see Rosalind Franklin down here, and they came up with this structure, and you can see what they were working, they were modeling right over here. So they knew that there was a, thing, a sugar phosphate backbone, right? And it's two helix, a double helix with a sugar phosphate backbone with paired bases. And those paired bases are held together by hydrogen bonds. And I want you to look at the pattern already, okay? Between adenine and thymine, there are two hydrogen bonds. And between guanine and cytosine, there are three hydrogen bonds. You can see why it could maintain a constant diameter because your sugar phosphate backbone, that 
there's no variability there. You're just going sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. But what, where you have the variability is in your nitrogenous bases. But a purine is always paired with a pyrimidine, a double ring with a single ring. So that helps keep the diameter okay, of two nanometers across right here. Two, um, two nanometers across, and then 0.34 nanometers between each rung of the ladder. If you imagine this was a rung of a ladder point. And then when you do one compute, complete spiral, you have 10 nitrogenous base pairings in there. So each spiral is 3.4 nanometers from beginning all the way back around. Just imagine yourself descending a spiral staircase. All right, so on Watson and Crick, he wor wor Watson and Crick worked out the structure of DNA using Chargaff and Franklin's data. They received a Nobel Prize in 1962. The structure is a double helix with sugar phosphate backbone and paired bases, a purine with a pyrimidine. And then in the notes, you'll see that I put A2HT, that stands for two hydrogen bonds and G3HC on the inside. Okay, that finishes up 3.1, and or sorry, 12.1, and now I wanna do 12.2. Um, we're working our way there to talk about how this DNA replicates. Okay, so let's review a little bit before we do that. So first thing I wanna remind you of is that nucleotides are the building bricks, the blocks to build um, nucleic acids. And each nucleotide consists of a nitrogenous base for DNA, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine are your choices. Cytosine is a purine, that's why it's represented as one ring. You have the sugar and in DNA, that's deoxyribose. And then you have a phosphate group represented with a circle that you always see that in all the models, but this is really what it is, phosphorus surrounded by oxygen. Now, I want you to take a quick minute to remind yourself about this pinto sugar right here. So notice, imagine this as a house, okay? And I want you to think of this fifth carbon over here like a chimney, okay, over here on the side. Now, all the carbons, it's a five carbon sugar, right, deoxyribose, all the carbons are numbered. You can see one prime, two prime, three, four, and five. Carbon one is always the carbon that is bound to the nitrogenous base. That is always carbon number one. Now, if you started to go up on the roof, you're not going to go that way because you're going to run into an oxygen. So no, don't go that way. You need to go the other way in your numbering. Here's carbon two and three. So like if this were a house, there'd be a door right here. There's a reason why I keep saying this. Then four and then the chimney makes five. OK, now if we look at this next slide here, we can see the difference between ribose and deoxyribose. Um, so, you know, wherever you don't see something right here, this is a hydrogen. So notice ribose has OHOH, deoxy without an oxygen here. So it's just a hydrogen. So I just want to remind you of that. That's going to become important later. I want to remind you of purines and primidines. OK, and then I want you to see if we took that double helix and we ironed it flat like a ladder, the rungs of the ladder would be the nitrogenous bases. Then you have alternating phosphate sugars on either side. Here is a single nucleotide. OK, and you can see there is a nitrogenous base, a sugar and a phosphate, and they are held together by hydrogen bonds. Now, it's important that you see something right here. I want you to look at the sugars. Look at the houses, okay? So on this side, right? On this side, do you see how all the houses look the right side up? And on this side, they look upside down, right? It's important that you see that DNA is like, is, um, like a road going two different directions. It's anti-parallel the way it is arranged. So I want you to see as well, I'm gonna start right up here at the top. Here's your nitrogenous base. Look where it at attaches to the sugar. So on the sugar, this is carbon one, two, three, four, chimney makes five. And the chimney is connected right here to this phosphate group right here, okay? Now, if we go down to the far end down here, here's your nitrogenous base. You're going in. This is carbon one, two, three. So this is why this is referred to as the three prime end, and this is referred to as the five prime end. When you look across the street over here, here is your nitrogenous base coming into the sugar. Here is carbon one. We can't go up this way because this is where the oxygen is. 
two, three. So this is referred to as the three prime end. And then as you would predict, one, two, three, four, here is your five prime end. This becomes significant when we discuss DNA replication because enzymes can, remember how they're specific and they're active site. So they can read the three prime end of the DNA making complementary five prime end on the other side. So you make it five to three, you're actually synthesizing it in the five to three prime direction, but you're reading three to five on your template strand. All right, so you can see that again here. Let's see if I can lower myself. Okay, so you can see that here. Here is your nitrogenous base, one, two, three, four, five, and right across the street, it runs the other way. So if you were an enzyme approaching from the bottom of the page, okay, you could read this three prime, but you could not read this five prime. You could not replicate the DNA from this direction. So we're going to talk about leading and lagging strands. So wherever it, you face a three prime end, that will be our leading strand. It's easy for it to read. And over here, we have to come up with another way. We have to backstitch to, um, to replicate that because it is a five prime end. All right. So um, in my class, we will practice labeling this diagram. Could you label this diagram? I wanna give you a hint, the phosphates and sugars should be easy. You should be able to also label the three and five prime end. When you're trying to decide the middle here, look at the number of hydrogen bonds and look at the size of the box to know if it's a purine or a primidine. But all of you should be able to label this as well as the three and five prime ends. Okay, so DNA replication. The original DNA unwinds and unzips and serves as template strands to form new DNA. And that is called semi-conservative replication. So from this one strand, okay, you will get two. Now, where did the replication start? Down here on the ends, and it's working its way in the direction towards what's called the replication fork, where it splits like a fork in the row. Okay, so here, now, this right here might seem a little confusing right now, but you're going to understand all of these enzymes, I promise you. This is where the party is getting started, okay? And you have a leading strand up here. So this must be where the three prime was building five to three. And so your enzyme, and there's a little more to this story, but the enzyme DNA polymerase three could read it no problem. And it's starting here and it's building building the darker blue. Notice the original DNA is the light blue strand, okay? So it's building this dark blue strand towards the replication fork right here, bringing in the nucleotides, right? And making sure that your base pairing is correct. That's your DNA polymerase three, that's the leading strand. We still need to replicate this strand over here. It's gonna take a little bit, make it a little bit harder, a little bit slower, because it cannot read the sugar in this direction because this is a five prime end and you can only read the three. So what it does is it waits for some of it to be unwound and then it jumps back, turns around and then goes this direction. And then some more will be under un, unwound, it'll jump back. So it's always reading three to five, making five to three. So I'm gonna tell you right here, right? This would be the, five prime end on this new strand. And the five prime end on the new strand is over here on the one above, okay? So this is called semi-conservative replication because each original strand serves as a template for the new strand. So you always get an old and new together. So of course I'm in the way right here. So here's your parent strand in the blue, and then you have your new strand here in, in red, okay? And on your notes, underneath 12.2 introduction, semi-conservative replication, each daughter DNA double helix contains an old strand from the parental DNA double helix and a new strand. The old strand serves as a template for the new strand. And this is just one more picture showing you that same thing that I just talked to you about. The original strand in purple, new is coming in here on green, but they will be exactly the same, right? If this purple right here is an adenine, this right here in green is a thymine, just like over here was a thymine and now this is an adenine. So it's the same base sequence. These right here, these two ladders you see, 
These are your sister chromatids that are held together by centromeres. They're going to separate during anaphase, right? Either anaphase of mitosis or anaphase two of myomyomyosis. These doubled ladders right here are your sister chromatids, are your sister chromatids. All right, now I'm gonna introduce some of the enzymes and then a few more enzymes. So here's your original DNA strand. Now, remember we talked about euchromatin and heterochromatin, right? Heterochromatin is condensed, tightly wound up, um, whereas euchromatin is getting expressed. You can't replicate the DNA if it's all tightly wound up. So what you have is you have an enzyme called topo, topoisomerase, which will help undo the supercoiling. And then you have helicase, which will separate those strands to create that replication for it from each other. Okay, now you one of the enzymes you will use, notice these all end in ACE, so they're enzymes, is DNA polymerase three. It's called three because it reads from three to five, making complementary five to three. It's making the other side of the street, right? And that's DNA polymerase three. And then you have another enzyme called ligase, which helps seal everything together. And I'll explain that part in just a little bit. Okay, so on your notes, let's get a few of these down. For unwinding, topoisomerase works on double-stranded DNA to deal with the supercoiling to either relieve or induce. DNA helicase separates the double-stranded DNA into single strands. And then I'm going to show you SSB, single-stranded binding protein, binds to a single-stranded DNA and prevents it from reforming a double helix. I'll show you that. All right. So this is what's called a replication bubble. And what happens is wherever your DNA, where you're starting, you have your origin of replication. So remember, you've got this long DNA. So you're like, I'm starting here, right here in the middle. So at this point, okay, let us assume that this side is the three prime end and the other one is the five prime, just on other here. So if this is three, then across the street, it has to be five, right? And if this is three, right next to it is the five prime end. So across the street, it has to be three. Now, remember, wherever it has the three prime end, then that is the leading strand and it can just take off. And that DNA polymerase is going to copy it right along. It's going to go very quickly and it's going to happen here on the on the other side as well. But you also, you have this lagging strand and you, you're trying to replicate out this way towards those replication forks, right? So this is where you have to jump back and go, jump back and go, jump back and go. Now, I'm gonna introduce another enzyme to you. RNA primase. RNA primase lays down primer. Where you see the red on here, this is primer. You need something to get your party started for the DNA polymerase to work off of. So RNA primase lays down a little primer here and then the DNA polymerase three can make your complementary DNA strands. Here, remember how we have to keep jumping back and working, jumping back and working. That primer marks that spot for us. And so it has to be put down multiple times as it gets unwound so it can jump back and go. It's backstitching, jump back and go. So primer is laid down multiple times on the lagging strand and it only has to be laid down once on the primer strand, I, I'm on the leading strand. So if this is leading, remember they're going opposite directions, so across the street would be the lagging. You can see the primer was laid down multiple times, but if this is the lagging across the street is leading, so it gets to take off. So when you're at that origin of replication, right? If this is leading, then going the other direction is also leading, and then the other two would be lagging, right? Kind of crisscross from each other would be the same. All right, so if you think about it, okay, if you think about a road going two different ways, and you're standing in the center divider, right? You're standing in the center divider. At one side, the roads come, cars are coming towards you. This way they're going away, but if you're facing on the other side, it's the opposite, right? And so the enzyme can work fast from the three prime end. That is your leading strand. So let's take a look at it this way. We're gonna look at just one replication fork, okay? So if we look, we're just looking at one of the replication forks on one side. All right, so it starts, you have topoisomerase has undone the supercoiling. Helicase is separating them. You can see that right here is separating them out. So let's get them to separate out a little bit more. So it's starting to undo. Notice this is three to five and five to three, right? So here's our leading strand. So 
your primer um, can be put down right here by RNA primase and then DNA polymerase can just take off and this just go in that direction. Here, right, it, it can't work off of this. It needs a thumb and there's no thumb here. So it has to wait, jump back and put some primer down and then DNA polymerase will come here. And as this unwinds some more, as this replication fork gets pushed back, it'll keep jumping back and restarting and restarting and restarting on your lagging strand. But once it started here, it just it keeps going right along until it finishes. All right, so let's look at it with this picture. Okay, so same idea as before. So you have your leading strand on the left and lagging strand in blue on the right. So here you're able to just take off and make your complementary DNA using your DNA polymerase. They're just not showing you the primase on that one. Okay, but here on your lagging strand, it's a bunch of stops and starts because you have to keep turning around and getting in the right direction. Okay, now these intermittent strands of DNA Okay, um, those are called Okazaki fragments, Okazaki fragments, and we'll see some, see those ones one more time or two. All right, let's take a look at this picture and I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, and this is the picture up here on the right that I showed you before. So we're looking at the left-hand part of that picture that I showed you earlier. So this right here is where we are right here. All right, so the first thing that happens is they're not showing you topoisomerize, topoisomerize in this picture, but that's already undone the supercoiling. Helicase is breaking those hydrogen bonds apart that are wanting to, to bind back. And SSB, um, let me give you another picture here. Here we go. SSB here in gray are the single-stranded binding proteins that are keeping it so that they can't reform. Think of it like magnets wanting to come back together. So SSB is keeping them apart. So on your notes, on um, we already did SSB. Let's talk about complementary base pairing. I'm gonna show you the RNA primase. Let me go one more here. So you can see this primase right here in pink, this enzyme is currently laying down some primer. And before that, it laid it down here. And before that, it had put it here. And before that, it was right here, okay? So this is kind of showing you over time. Now, where is the primase on this leading strand? It's somewhere underneath my head, underneath this yellow square, because it started that primer, laid down that primase, and the DNA polymerase three just took off, and it's gonna keep going, zzz, all the way out and done. But remember, you have to keep turning around and laying down primer multiple times. So primase on the leading and the lagging strand is laid down, okay? DNA polymerase three can work off of the primer. It's doing it here on the lagging strand. It, it, it did it a long time ago here on the leading strand, and here's that DNA polymerase three here, bringing in complementary base pairing, okay? Then once you've done that, DNA polymerase one, I always say he's the one to save you. DNA polymerase one removes primer, the RNA, right? Because you don't want RNA nucleotides in the middle of your DNA nucleotides and replaces it with DNA nucleotides right here. And then last but not least, then you have DNA ligase who seals the bonds from every place where you had to remove primer because the DNA polymerase three, it's not a continuous process. So you need to seal those bonds in order to make sure um, that it's continuous DNA, all right? So do you remember when we looked out the house it was like a chimney, right? When we had the fifth carbon in the sugar and how it stood up like a chimney, right? And then we had the phosphate group there. Well, that's called a phosphodiester bond when you hook the chimney of one house to the bottom of the next house. So you're connecting, right, the phosphate and the sugar backbone. Okay, along there. All right, so let's put a few notes down for that. So we are on um, complementary base pairing. We said RNA primase synthesizes short RNA primers, that would be in red right here, and they're about 10 base pairs long, those short primers, that allows DNA polymerase, the next step, to work. DNA polymerase, you have two different ones of those. DNA polymerase three synthesizes DNA from the three prime in. Now remember, it's 
working off the three prime, but it's making complementary five. On the leading strand, it is continuous. On the lagging strand, it is discontinuous. And those discontinuous fragments, remember, are called Okazaki fragments. And they are about 1,000 to uh, 2,000 base pairs long. So these not represented well. Here it looks like there's like nine of them. But there's this really, these Okazaki fragments are 1,000 to 2,000 base pairs. And then DNA polymerase one that you see right here removes the primers and proofreads, removes the primers and proofreads, make sure you have the base pairing correctly. And then the joining DNA ligase right here seals the phosphate sugar backbone, forming a phosphodiester bond. Phospho, P-H-O-S, P-H-O, diester, D-I-E-S-T-E-R bond forming a phosphodiester bond. The, then the hydrogen bonds are holding them together, right, in the center as well. So you have that hydrogen bonds hold the two strands together. All right, so this is just showing you another picture for you to kind of process in your brain. Um, let me make myself here. Um, so here you can see the DNA double helix. You can see topoisomerase already took place. Here is your helicase. This is your SSB. Remember, it started somewhere back over here, right? So here on your leading strand, you're reading three, right? You're reading the three prime end, making new five to three. The light green is the new one that's getting laid down here by DNA polymerase three. This is not showing you the primer that was needed up here, but it was. Okay, and then here on our lagging strand, we started way back here, right? But if we wanna look at it in sequence, so you have your primase laying down your primer in purple, about 10 base pairs long. DNA polymerase three works off the primase. Remember, it's back stitching. That's why it's taking longer. And then you have um, your RNA primer will be removed by DNA polymerase one. And then ligase will seal these Okazaki fra fragments together. All right, so I wanted to give you a list, if I could get myself out of the way, a list if you wanted to pause and take a screenshot and pop that into your notes of all the different enzymes, I have already gone over those with you, okay? But you could just pause the video. All right, um, one more, like, I gotta give you like 10,000 diagrams. Here I wanted to show you so you could see the topoisomerase um, undoing the supercoiling. Here's the helicase splitting the hydrogen bonds apart. You can see the primase laying down primer. You can see DNA polymerase three in here and also up here working this direction towards the fork, right? Everybody's working towards that fork in the road. All right, um, and then, here, I wanted just to compare and contrast DNA replication um, in prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Remember, prokaryotes have a single circular chromosome, whereas eukaryotes have linear chromosomes. So on your notes for prokaryotic versus eukaryotic replication, um, prokaryotic DNA replication is a little letter A, single circular chromosome, so it can be replicated in both directions in about 40 minutes. Um, the origin of replication is the specific site where the replication begins. Like right here, they've identified the origin. Um, eukaryotic DNA replication is initiated at several different sites, replication bubbles, each with two replication forks, right? So here's your replication bubble. And there's a fork here and a fork there that you're working in those directions. You can't really tell in this diagram the difference between the leading and the lagging strand. Um, accuracy of replication. Um, so the accuracy is ensured because um, you want to have the specificity of base pairing A, T, and G, and C. If you need a repair, a mismatch repair in which the special repair enzymes fix incorrectly paired nucleotides, you have nucleotide excision and repair. In incorrectly replaced nucleotides are excised or removed by enzymes termed nucleases. And then the gap left over is filled with the correct nucleotides. And DNA polymerase one also assists with that. All right, so that was part one and we are done. Um, for my students, I hopefully broke that into two videos for you. And then part two will be the next video. And in part two, we're gonna talk about how we use that DNA in order to make RNA and eventually proteins. So I hope you're having a great day.